it's not every day that we have an opportunity like that. We are really honored that Stephen Wolfer made it. He's here to speak to you. So his journey is really amazing. He's like a true like technology entrepreneur. He was a, a very early, like a child prodigy, I would say, like a 15 year old, uh, at age 15, he published his first paper. Uh, at age 21, he got his PhD at Caltech, our friends in California, <laughs> in the West Coast. And, uh, and during his uh, time, his graduate school time, he designed, uh, started designing like what was the, um, the source of the products he launched later, like all from Mathematica, Alpha and all of the, the project suites he built around this, uh, what was like his school project. So it's amazing that he's been here with us to share. So I'll pass the microphone for him. Thank you so much. Yes, great. All right, so thanks. So, so I happen to be in Brazil because every four years, the world's mathematics community has a fancy conference called the International Congress of Mathematicians that they've been having for the last 100 years or so. And it moves around from place to place. And right now, it happens to be in Brazil. So that, that's, that's why I'm in Brazil. It's the first time I visited Brazil. So, uh, and it's also cool that sort of the world's top mathematicians meet. And they pretty much all use the products we've built, which is always encouraging. So, so maybe I'll tell you a little bit of, of my entrepreneurial story and um, uh, kind of a little bit about the products we built, what, where I see them fitting in, and uh, perhaps some useful lessons about innovation. I suppose the most bizarre thing is that I've been running the same company for 32 years. I'm not a serial entrepreneur. I'm a, I'm a well, I, actually, it's the second company I started. So I'm a, uh, but I've been running the same company for 32 years, um, and I think we've done uh, really a pretty good job at sort of continued R&D innovation over that period of time. And it's still, it's a reasonably small company. It's about 800 people, almost all R&D. Our commercial operations are actually quite small compared to our R&D efforts. Um, we built, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I, how I got to do this. Um, as mentioned, um, I happened to start doing science when I was really young. I was really into physics in the late 1970s. That was at a time when physics was having its golden age. I mean, today, you know, machine learning, blockchain, whatever, those are, those are things having their golden age. The late 1970s was the time when particle physics had its golden age. It's always cool to be involved in things when they're in their kind of golden age, because the stuff you invent kind of lasts forever. Because, they, you know, that, that's the time when there's lots of innovation. Typically, some new methodology has become available. and. Um, the, uh, uh, and that allows, that opens up a bunch of things. Then things get invented over a period of maybe five to 10 years, and then the field kind of levels off. And I happen to be lucky enough to be involved in physics when it was in a, a very rapid change state. So that means that stuff that I invented when I was a teenager still gets used in physics today and so on, which is fun. But one of the features of doing physics is that you end up having to do lots of mathematical calculations and so on. I always found those kind of uh, frustratingly boring, and I wasn't particularly good at them. And so I realized, you know, this is, this is something quite mechanical. We should be able to automate it. And so I started building computer systems uh, to, to automate mathematical calculations. Um, and that was, was a result. I mean, I, at first I was dealing with a computer that was the size of a desk and so on. They gradually got smaller. Uh, I was at Caltech. I got my PhD, and then I was on the faculty there. And um, I kind of decided that um, I should build kind of a general system for doing things like mathematical computation. Um, so I, I did that starting in, in about 1979, um, got it finished around 1981. And then the question was, what was I going to do with the software system? And so my first idea was you know, license it through the university. That didn't work out. So I kind of got backed into starting my first company. Um, at that time, I was 21 years old or so. And I thought, you know, I'm a young physics professor. What the heck do I know about starting companies? Um, and uh, so I tried reading books about it. That was absolutely useless. So then eventually I, I, um, uh, I ended up hiring a sort of management team, uh, including a CEO who was about twice my age, which, um, and, and they were not, the, it was, um, and then we got early venture capital. In those days, you know, venture capital was sort of based in New York, not in San Francisco. 
um, and uh, kind of did a, a traditional, well, it wasn't in those times, it wasn't traditional yet, but in these times, one would say it was sort of a traditional startup kind of company. Um, as it turned out, I found it very frustrating because I thought, you know, there's sort of common sense things about the business decisions we should be making, and I kept on thinking, this is the common sense decision. These guys that I brought in want to do the opposite. You know, what's going to happen? Needless to say, it turned out I was too often right. And so I decided, you know, time for me to, that, you know, that this wasn't going to work out. Actually, that company ended up, after many rounds of adventure, ended up going public in the, in the mid-90s in a rather undistinguished IPO. But um, the, um, anyway, I, I, um, I kind of uh, bailed out of that um, and went back to doing basic science and was rather successful in starting this area that now gets called complexity theory and so on and sort of started building up a whole effort in, in that kind of science. And then at some point, I, I realized that to make progress even in the science I was doing, I needed to build better tools. And so then I started in 1986, I started building uh, what became Mathematica, um, and that sort of turned into, and so Mathematica these days gets used like most, uh, pretty much all major universities in the US have site licenses for Mathematica. Most R&D operations have uh, large-scale licenses for it. It's been used to discover and invent a large number of things in, in the world. Actually, we just had the 30th anniversary of the release of Mathematica um, about a month ago. And I was, I was really excited because I got, you know, I managed to get Mathematica version 1 running on an old Mac SE30, um, you know, read it off the floppy disks and so on, get it running and uh, use a Mathematica notebook and do some computations. And then I decided, let me take the thing I built, you know, the thing I just wrote in Mathematica version 1, and let me move it to a modern version 11.3 that just came out. And the exciting thing for me was that the things I'd written in Mathematica version 1 just worked in version 11.3, sort of with a space of 30 years between them. So that was a, was a nice thing to realize that the things we built, I mean, for me, the thing that's been exciting about what we've done is that we've been able to just keep building more and more technology, more and more layers of technology. We haven't had to go back and say, whoops, we did the wrong thing, you know, let's change that and, and do something different. We've been able to, to sort of just keep building what we've been building. I, I guess the, the um, uh, about nine years ago now, we released a thing called Wolfram Alpha, which is the thing that, for example, powers the knowledge component of Siri and other intelligent assistants and so on. And it's something that uh, there's sort of a corporate version that's been becoming uh, very nice and popular in companies that are interested in asking kind of natural language questions about their, their data. I mean, the typical sort of Wolfram Alpha thing to do. It's just an example here, very, very tiny example. Uh, I asked it about International Space Station and it's using kind of a combination of uh, a feed of knowledge about the world together with computations to figure out, for example, where is the International Space Station right now, uh, some characteristics of it, and so on. And this is all, so the basic idea is it's, you know, computing answers to questions. So if I say population of uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, divided by Brazil, for example, um, it should, well, at least I can type quickly. Let's see whether, I don't know what, what the, okay, there we go. So it's telling us that 3% of the population of Brazil is in Rio de Janeiro, and that's the, the plot as a function of time of, what, um, uh, of how that's gone. So this is, um, this is the typical kind of thing that, um, uh, that we can do with, uh, with Wolfram Alpha. And people you know, in companies um, are very interested in, in using this technology to be able to ask natural language questions unstructured questions about the structured data that exists in those companies. So that's become an interesting business for us. But what this is all based on is this thing we call Wolfram Language. And um, let me show you. I was just uh, visiting a school, and I was doing a demo to a bunch of high school kids. And I could probably, um, to save time, I could actually just show you the demo I did for them. But, but, um, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start off and do a few things for, for you guys. So the. Um, you know, you, you start asking questions, you just, uh, it's just, um, uh, you know, you ask the question, it computes the answer. The, um, the thing where it gets interesting is being able to deal with, so, so what we've tried to do, so the, the idea of what we call Wolfram language is to try and provide sort of a ubiquitous layer of computational intelligence 
for people who are building all kinds of things. So, you know, the way I see it, in sort of the history of computing, there's been, you know, at the beginning, 60 years ago, there were just raw computers, and you programmed them in machine code. Then there were some early languages, like Fortran and so on. Then there were early operating systems, user interfaces, and so on. And so as the years have gone by, there's sort of higher and higher levels of computational ability that people can take for granted when they use computers. And so what we are trying to do is to make sure that there's a, a layer of computational sophistication that people can take for granted. Let's say I, I make a network. This could be a, a social network uh, from somewhere. I could say, show me you know, the um, communities in this social network. So then it'll, it'll be able to compute that. Or I might say, you know, get me an image. Um, let's see. There we go. There's an image. Yeah, um, so I can, um, you know, I could do something. Uh, I could do something like um, edge detect that image, or I could ask it. Um, I could use some sort of modern machine learning. I could say, why don't you identify? Uh, let's see what it does here. Sometimes it'll produce. A, okay, great. It says it's a person. <laughs> yeah, good. If I, we have a classifier for. Let's see whether this works. Um, the uh, this may produce some embarrassing result, but who knows? Um, let's see. OK, good. <laughs> so, so kind of the idea here is um, to, to be able to build in as many computational algorithms as possible so that when you're creating you know, your, your app for your startup or whatever, that you don't have to go and figure out how to build an image identifier or how to build something that, that partitions graphs or whatever else. I mean, we can do, uh, here, let, let's try something like this. We can say something like um, capital cities in South America. So we're using kind of natural language to enter, um, uh, to, to enter our question, but it's turning into this symbolic language that is this uh, precise language that we've defined. OK, so I get, there's the result. And now, for example, I could say, OK, let's make a, a plot um, of where those cities are. And now it should produce a map. Assuming it, there we go. So it makes a map of those things. Let's say I want to know, um, let's say that I want to do, uh, uh, let's say I want to visit all those cities. And I could say, um, and I want the shortest path. So I can say, find shortest tour of all those cities. And then, oops. What I need to do instead is say, find shortest tour around the positions of all those cities. Um, and there we go. Um, so this will now try and work out um, what, uh, come on, wake up. Um, see, the problem is every time it's um, uh, much of the information it has, all, all the algorithms are running locally on my computer, but every time it has to, oh, there we go. So it just told me that there's a, a path that I can take around all the cities in the capital cities in South America. It's about 17,000 miles long, and that's the ordering of cities. So I can take that ordering. Let's just do this. Um, so let's order the cities in that order, and then let's make another plot um, of those cities in the order that I that will be the shortest tour. And there's the result. So what's what I consider to be important about this is you know, lots of stuff has to kind of come together and work to be able to easily just compute something like that. Um, maybe I can try, let, let me show you something else. Let, let me show you how you would, um, uh, let's say I make something here. Um, so I make a, a little um, interactive little widget thingy. Um, so let's say, oops, I want to say, um, Make a plot of this, uh, do that. OK, so this will now sort of create a little interactive demonstration type thing. And now you might say, well, what if I want to kind of deploy that? What if I want to show that to, to people? What if, I, what if that's the result of doing some kind of data science study, and I want to uh, publish that to the world? So I can just say cloud publish of that. And then what it'll do is, um, uh, again, it has to communicate with the, OK, there we go, communicate with the cloud. Now, that will have deployed this into something that is just a web page. 
Um, so now I've just, I, this is just a web page, and every time I move this slider, it'll have to go communicate with the server to get the new result, but it's still something that can happen just purely uh, on the web. And um, actually, this whole technology that I'm using of these, uh, these notebooks um, are, um, uh, you, can, you can do that, you can do everything I've been doing here just directly on the web as well. And you can kind of annotate what's happening here and kind of say, um, uh, you know, interactive uh, stuff or something. You can kind of make a, this is sort of a way of presenting um, uh, data science results, for example, is to make kind of a computational essay that's a mixture of kind of human language together with, uh, uh, with our Wolfram language. So anyway, you can, you can um, just at a practical level, if you're actually building software, um, thing that's interesting is to see what happens if you want to, um, uh, let, let's do something like, um, oh, let's make a, a map of somewhere around, so let's say we want to make a, we have a location, and we want to say, um, uh, make a, uh, let's do this, make, let's make a map um, that is a particular radius around that location, um, and how does that work? There we go. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say create an app that basically allows me to type in a location in the world, and what did I do wrong here? Um, Um, oh, what am I doing wrong? I have made a mistake. Uh, oh, that's my mistake. There we go. Um, okay. So, anyway, this, this hopefully will deploy to the web. And now I can, for example, type in, uh, I don't know, Eiffel Tower, for example, here. Um, and uh, it will use natural language understanding to figure out what I meant by that. And then hopefully, oh, I made a mistake. Uh, what did I do wrong? Um, Ah, that's what I did wrong, sorry. Uh, I knew I did. Okay, let's try it again. Um, okay, let's say, ah, what did I do? I did something terribly wrong here. All right, this is a case where I actually have to read what I did to, yes, there's the mistake. There, okay, close that, close that, close that. Now, you see, the problem is, as I, I made a mistake as I was typing this in, and now it is hard for me. Geographics, that, one page, yes, there we go. Okay, terrific. Um, so, actually, what's fun with this language is that we're now in a position. Oh, here, let, let's just type in Eiffel Tower here, and we should, we should get a result. What will be happening now is that that little web app was running and it was uh, 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 running the code that I specified here and giving me a result. I could turn this into, if you, you know, if you're really building, doing software engineering, you can make that an API function. You can create a, a web API. You can ask it to show you uh, the code that you would use if you, if you had some application written in Java or something. You could say, show me the code that you would use to embed that in your Java application so that you can call the Wolfram language code from, from inside Java. So, so that's kind of the, um, that's kind of what we've done. What, what's, what's kind of interesting about this whole technology stack is that it is, we've, we've sort of, the, the goal has been to sort of build everything into the system in a coherent way. Um, that's a very different approach than people have taken in, in building computer languages in the past. Um, and it's taken, you know, 30 years to build all this stuff. But the result is that we've got something where people can very immediately uh, create really quite magic things. I mean, the, you know, there are lots of startups that have been using our technology stack to do all kinds of things. Um, it's sort of become the, the kind of magic uh, solution for people at hackathons and so on, where you can kind of uh, quickly create something that people say, how on earth do you do that? When we look at it, it's like, well, that was actually pretty easy to do. But um, uh, the, um, the other thing that's interesting about it is that for kids, this is something where the, uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the sort of computational sophistication that um, uh, is now being used by sort of the world's top R&D folk is also accessible to kids. And so, like, I've been doing a bunch of stuff with middle school kids. A lot of other people have been doing things with, with kids from sort of age 10 or so up. 
um, with, this, with this language. And um, it's pretty neat to see that sort of kids can become proficient at sort of doing the computational thinking necessary to go from an idea that they have to something they can actually implement. So anyway, it's, it's um, uh, one thing I've been doing. So you know, in our company, the, you know, the challenge is how do you build all this stuff? How do you keep on building these things? How do you keep on innovating for, for 30 years and so on? I've developed, uh, so our company is very geographically distributed, which is sort of interesting. I mean, I, I myself am based near Boston. Um, our company headquarters is in Illinois. Um, we probably have even a, let's see, if I go to our company homepage, we probably have um, our HR department usually maintains a, a map. Let's see where it is. Um, company, uh, where is it? Careers. And someplace here, locations. Okay, so this is, a, this is an approximate map of uh, where our employees are, um, and it's, it's quite diverse. And so we've been running kind of a distributed organization now for, for 30 years, um, and people say, how on earth can you do that? You know, that can't possibly work. Actually, it works great. Um, you know, when we, the typical thing that happens in our company, you know, I view our company at a very egotistical level as a machine for turning ideas that I have into real things. And so I tend to generate new projects at a rapid rate, and we've kind of built a whole project management infrastructure that absorbs kind of new project ideas and tries to, tries to turn them into reality. It's kind of neat when you, when you start a project, you know, it's not like you have to move people around between offices because they're all going to be clustered somewhere. It's just like, here's a list of people. Some of them might be in South Africa. Some of them might be in Australia, the US, wherever. Um, you know, you've, you've immediately got a team, and, and you can start doing things. Um, I tend to, I mean, my personal management style, I, you know, even though I'm a thousand miles away from our company headquarters and I only visit a few times a year, um, I'm probably viewed as an outrageous micromanager and our company is, is uh, you know, it's very, uh, kind of everything is, is very much done uh, sort of in a, in a structured kind of computational way. Um, I think one of the things I, I do is, is I, I end up doing myself as a, as a kind of management uh, methodology, I suppose, I end up doing a lot of kind of thinking in public, so to speak. So, you know, every day, my day is full of meetings from sort of beginning to end, and, and each one of those is some review of some project or some, uh, some strategy uh, uh, discussion. And um, I end up finding, you know, we end up with um, usually, I don't know, some five to 25 people probably in some meeting, and our goal is to actually figure out what to do in that meeting. Um, and I tend to, you know, a lot of managers, CEOs, whatever, will kind of, you know, the actual thinking process is somehow hidden from the rest of the team. I like to actually figure stuff out in real time. And actually, one thing I've done recently, uh, particularly for our product design meetings, which is uh, quite a lot of what I do, I've ended up, um, I think, you know, we don't have direct competitors or anything. And I think these product design meetings are pretty interesting. So I started sometime late last year, I started actually live streaming a bunch of uh, these uh, design review meetings. So there's now uh, hundreds of hours of uh, what, what, what's actually involved in designing our products. It's quite interesting. I didn't think this would happen, but you know, a lot of very sophisticated people have been tuning in to these live streams, and they make comments. And sometimes their comments are actually really pretty good ideas. It's like having an instant focus group of your sophisticated users um, as, as you're actually working on design things. The other thing that's been kind of interesting is that we had one new version of our product that came out since I've been doing this live streaming. And the, the, uh, the people who sort of saw some feature being designed are like really excited that you know, this feature that they saw being designed is now actually in the product distributed to everybody. So you know, I suppose that the, um, you know, our company has had a very, um, we probably have a bunch of statistics someplace. The, um, uh, our company, you know, as I say, I started the company 32 years ago. We've got a lot of long-term employees. We've also got a lot of new people coming in. Uh, I guess our, our number one mechanism for finding really interesting people is we have a, um, let's see if I can pull it up. Uh, let's see. Um, we have every year we do a summer school that's sort of a combination of science, technology. Let me see, where is it? Um, well, this is, let's see, that's our, um, that's the blurb about our summer school, but more interesting than the blurb is some, um, um, so, so, yeah, this, this is sort of our, this is, the, that's, that's the blurb. That's, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is the projects people do. 
So this is um, this is this year's um, this year's projects. It's a, a three-week summer school, and um, the the idea is that people come in and sort of do an original project that they create with code. They actually uh, make a complete thing um, in in three weeks, and all kinds of interesting stuff gets done. Um, and this has been sort of our our principal way of um, uh, of finding really good talent from from around the world. I mean, it's one of one of many ways. But but um, the um, uh, so um, I, I found. I mean, in terms of in terms of running a company like ours, I mean, I, I pass on a few bits and pieces that that I've learned at least. I mean, my theory of companies is basically on day one, the CEO has to know has to do everything, and gradually. As you understand more about how the company should work, you can gradually hire people who can do some pieces of what you're doing maybe better than you can do them. Whenever there's a piece of what we do that I don't understand, it ends up not getting done very well. And that's possibly a factor of the fact that you know, I don't pay as much attention to it. I don't really know. But my observation is you know, when people say, well, I'm the CEO, but I've got, you know, I've got the CTO over here, and that's the person who really understands what's going on, that's a really bad sign. I mean, the CEO actually has to understand what's happening. And you know, I know in our company, for example, our ERP system, for example, our transaction processing system and so on, I never paid any attention to this. And it was just such a piece of junk. And we finally, a few years ago, it, it kind of timed out on the whole thing. And so we started building our own ERP system using our own language. And now we're building something quite wonderful that we'll probably sell to lots of other people as well. But uh, you know, it was an example of something where it didn't really matter that much to the operations of our company because our company isn't that special in terms of transaction processing. And um, you know, but it was something where where um, uh, it was a, a typical example of this: if the CEO doesn't understand, it doesn't work very well. We should we should wrap up fairly soon, but maybe we have time for a, a few questions or comments or something. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. As Danielle told me, then you have another commitment, but it would be great if you could answer a few questions from yeah, our happy, happy to, to bootcamp participants. Yes. Hi, Stephen. My name is Tandega from South Africa. I'm high-key having a creepy moment right now. <laughs> I'm a big fan of your work. My question is, um, clearly you've been doing this for a number of years, and there's probably a science behind it, but how do you keep up with not only just your business, but the technology behind it, and many other social trends that are happening while running the company, staying relevant, and also knowing everything within your company? But, and also, sorry. I, sorry, and, and also knowing everything that's happening within your company. Because you just mentioned that the CEO needs to know everything that's happening. So I'm saying with all of those, in addition, you need to know everything that's happening. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, so, you know, I, look, I like new stuff, and I like new ideas, and so I pay pretty good attention to what's happening in the world. For, for a while, I didn't travel very much and so on, and then I started traveling. I think, you know, it, it helps that I've been around the technology industry for a long time, so I know pretty much a pretty good cross-section of the leaders in the industry. And it, it, that's a, a really good way to kind of uh, sort of stay stay in touch with what's important and what's what's happening. But I find um, uh, you know so I tend to work on fairly long-term projects. So for example, uh, in 1991, I wrote down a kind of to-do list of what we should do for our product. We finally finished that to-do list last year. So that's my that's my year of birth, by the way. What's that? I'm saying that's my entire lifetime. I was born in 91. Right. Right. So. So the, the um, uh, so but you know what's interesting is that about half of the things we we've done are things that were sort of on that to do list in some way, and half the things are things that just emerged as as opportunities um, when um, uh, you know subsequently. Now now one important thing. So so I mean you know in principle I could be infinitely busy and not have any time to do anything new. Somehow. I managed to actually spend a significant part of my time doing new stuff. I think this is an important kind of personal discipline. It requires, at some level, a little bit of irresponsibility because you know, I have to decide there are things I will not do for the company or whatever. I will not, like for example, I decided very early in the history of the company I will never get involved in individual sales situations. That is, there's a sales team and they sell stuff and that's not what I do. And because you know, it's very easy for a person who is leading a company like mine to like, spend 100% of their time selling stuff. 
I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm necessarily particularly good at it. I don't find it particularly interesting. I don't think it's a good use of my skills. So I just said, I'm not going to do that. Now, probably we would have sold a lot more stuff if I'd been doing some of that myself. Um, but, uh, you know, so there's a certain kind of, uh, in a sense, irresponsibility. I also try and make as efficient as possible the things that I'm doing. I mean, I've been a big, uh, you know, I, I tend to be, okay, I'm a data-oriented person, so I'm probably the, the human that's recorded more stuff about themselves than any other, but I can show you, let me show you something. Uh, let's see. Um, the, uh, um, I tend to be, wake up, wake up, wake up. This is going to go there. Okay, let me see. Um, uh, uh, what I want is personal analytics. Um, so this is this is actually a blog post I wrote uh, about six years ago now. So it could be it could be modernized, but this is um, this is kind of like um, my personal analytics. Like that's um, a dot for every piece of email I I sent between 1990 and 2012, um, and that's I've to date I've sent about 800,000 emails in my life. Um, but that's, you know, the, the white part is when I was asleep. Um, but, uh, you know, you can go down and you can see um, all kinds of, uh, okay, so that's the probability that I'm on the phone, at least as of 2012, as a function of time of day. Um, and so, you know, I, I try to make what I do as efficient as possible, and I've kind of built a whole structure um, to sort of make what I do efficient, and that allows me to kind of have time to think about new things. And so, you know, and, and I also, I find, um, I don't know, like recently we've been doing a lot of stuff with blockchain and so on. So if I, um, uh, if I go here, I could say, you know, um, uh, let's say here, you know, I could look, you know, that's what's the most recent block that was mined on the Ethereum blockchain. And if we can connect to the outside world because it's something that requires that. Okay, there we go. Um, the, the, uh, so we've been doing a lot of things with computational contracts and blockchain and so on, which is an example of a, a new thing. Now, what it ends up happening is, you know, I have to learn all kinds of different fields. I've been lucky enough, you know, I started off doing things like physics, computer science, and so on. And I've had to learn all these different fields because we've been steadily trying to make them computational. And I found, you know, after you've learned 100 fields, the 101st one is somewhat easier to learn. But I've kind of developed some methodology for how to do it that involves you know, you kind of have to ask, for any one of these fields, it's kind of like, what's the fundamental problem of the field? If the field is an old field, people have typically forgotten what it was. They've typically, oh, that was done, you know, 50 years ago. People talk, talked about that fundamental problem. It's either unsolvable or we're avoiding it now. And you kind of have to dig in to, to find that. But, you know, I've, I've kind of tried to develop some, some techniques for doing that. Um, and, but I, I do think, I mean, personally, probably, one of the things that I'm happy about in terms of my own activities is that I do manage to do new stuff all the time. And it, it's just way too easy to just, and it, it's way too easy for a company like ours to just say, well, we've got one successful product, um, you know, let's just stay with that. And there's a lot of pressure within a, within a company, there's always pressure to, um, uh, to just sort of take what we're doing and keep doing it. Um, and what I found is that, you know, we've developed a culture in our company where people know that new stuff is going to happen all the time. And for a while, in the first 10 years of the company, that wasn't really there. That, that culture wasn't really there. We had one successful product that was doing really well. And it took some, a pretty high degree of force on my part to sort of say, oh, we're actually got, you know, I had a special projects group, for example, which was kind of incubating crazy stuff that I wanted to do. So, for example, it incubated the Wolfram Alpha project which for a while I was sort of hiding 200 people who were working on that project and not kind of making it really obvious to the rest of my management team what was going on because it was kind of like, it was, oh, we don't really want to do new stuff. And it's like, okay, once it was done, they were very quick to say, it took like an hour or something after I could demo the thing for my management team to say, yeah, this is really exciting. That's cool that you were working on this, even though, you know, it was some, um, but I think, um, it, it took, so, you know, for a while I kind of had a special projects group that was doing the new weird stuff that was my crazy ideas. And then what ends up happening is the special projects group, the things it incubates, end up just being the mainstream things of the company. And after a while, people get used to the idea that there's always going to be new projects. And we have, you know, a good structure in project management, for example, that takes kind of a, a new idea about a project and, you know, there's a whole process of, we don't, it's not a very formal process. It's not something that's 
maybe the project management team has this all written down and they haven't told me, but um, uh, you know, of, you know, doing brainstorming meetings, uh, you know, keeping notes of what happened, being able to go through you know, kind of a design process um, to, to build what we're building. All right, another, maybe one or two more. Maybe the final questions? Yeah. Actually, you know, it's, it's probably easy. It's really hard for me to hear. When, when you are talking in the microphone and... Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, how does your company deal together that data from closed system, I would say, for example, Facebook or a phone running system? And how are you dealing with G GDPR limitations, legislation, this kind of thing? How does okay. it work? So, I mean, the data that we have in Wolfram Alpha and the public Wolfram Alpha, we've made, you know, deals with endless primary sources of data, whether it's for financial data, weather data, movie data, whatever else. Um, we kind of make deals with these, these primary sources of data. Some of it we curate ourselves. Um, some things like linguistic information, like, you know, what are the names by which such and such a company is typically known? That's stuff that can come from places like Wikipedia. In and to, for corporate data, um, that's, a, that's a different story because those are mostly companies using our tools internal to those companies, and they have their own private cloud or private version of Wolfram Alpha. In terms of public data, um, for example, um, well, for example, you mentioned Facebook. Actually, it was interesting because back in 2012, after I did that um, uh, blog post about personal analytics, people said, how can I do the same thing for myself? Of course, most people haven't collected very much data on themselves. But Facebook had collected a lot of data. And so we had a project to um, let people through Wolfram Alpha get this kind of books about information about themselves based on their Facebook profiles. And this was an example. It was like a 50-page book, basically, that you could get about yourself and your friends and all these kinds of things. So it was kind of the opposite. It was kind of revealed. Many people noticed, you know, oh my gosh, Facebook has all this information about me and my friends and so on. So for a while, we were collecting this stuff and doing sort of perfect privacy and just dumping the data. And then a friend of mine who's a sociology professor at Harvard actually um, said, you know, it's just outrageous for you to be just throwing away this data. This is the best sociology data you can get. And so, so we came with, up with this kind of anonymization method that was sort of related to the HIPAA uh, medical data anonymization techniques. And the result was that we were able to do some pretty big studies um, this is a, uh, uh, so this was a, a study of, that's the number of friends of users, that's, um, let's see, that's a, that one is fun, that's the, that's given that you're a particular age, like you're age 25, that's the ages of your friends, so people are very clustered in their own age, and until they get to age 50 and then they start friending their, their kids' friends, um, and you know, you can, you can, um, the, you can do all kinds of things with that, but, but, so this is an example, I mean, in terms of things like GDPR, we're, we're no more exposed to, to GDPR kinds of issues than, than your average company. I mean, I think it, it's a, it's a, um, uh, I think it's interesting that with computational contracts and things, um, one can be, one can be a little bit more uh, sophisticated and precise about what one might mean by privacy requirements and so on. But that's something that isn't, you know, that's not yet something that the world is doing. That's just something that we're interested in. Right, a few more things. I'll try and be quicker in, in um, uh, just, why don't you just ask, and I, I can probably hear you. Oh, sorry, go, go for it. Hi, so at the very beginning you mentioned that you were one of the pioneers of, of complexity theory. Uh, I'm sorry, the you know what, if you, if you just, you don't use the microphone and I'll repeat okay. the question. Right, okay, so the question was about complexity theory and how relevant it is to organizations. So one of the hardest things in life is to live one's own paradigm, so to speak. You know, you invent some paradigm, and the question is, do you actually use that paradigm in doing what you do? The thing that I think I have done pretty successfully is to use uh, computation as kind of a conceptual paradigm in, in building up the things we do at the company. In terms of, I mean, a lot of what I did in, um, so the, the sort of the biggest thing that um, I sort of, produced in the kind of world of complexity theory, it turned into this big book uh, called New Kind of Science um, that has been very influential, I would say, in making the transition in the world from kind of a time when mathematical equations were kind of the, the dominant form of modeling that people used to a time when programs are kind of the dominant form of modeling that people use. 
It's kind of a remarkable thing. 300 years of mathematical equations, and the last 15 years, basically, when new models get made of things, they're almost always programs-based models. Now, in terms of, of organizational structure, um, you know, I, I, I see all these things people say they do based on complexity theory, and I'm like, oh my gosh, how can this possibly work? So I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, uh, so I, I said at the beginning, I, my, my preface to this was it's difficult to live one's own paradigm. I'm not sure that I have lived a kind of complexity theory-based company organization. Um, in fact, I probably, you know, strangely for myself, I'm a person who's really interested in people, um, and so that's sort of a, a, a dichotomy because I'm also interested in, you know, AI and automating people out of the picture and the way that one can sort of deconstruct everything. But I happen to be personally also interested in people, and that's super useful when you're running a company because I think after, you know, I, 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 sometimes I think, you know, have I, uh, you know, I've been managing people for 40 years, and I must have seen every possible bizarre pathological thing that could happen. But no, there's a new one. And, uh, you know, you have, to, um, uh, you have to be interested in people to not go crazy dealing with that. I mean, it's also, at the company, one of the things I find important is, you know, you have a certain set of people. We've, we've been able to get very talented people, I'm happy to say. And um, the, um, then, the, then the issue is, you know, you've got a certain set of projects and tasks you want to do. And I, I view one of my main roles as a manager to be, how do I figure out, given those people, how do I sort of fit them together with, um, uh, with the tasks that, uh, that need to be done? And people... <laughs>